Why did magic seem logical to people of the Renaissance? That's the question for this episode of Theories of History. Hi there, I'm Jostein, and I make videos about theories of history in historical literature. If you're as nerdy as me or simply like my videos, I hope you consider subscribing so we can see each other again soon. Today I'll be discussing Michel Foucault's book from 1966, The Order of Things. I put a link to the book and some recommended reading in the description below. Foucault was a French philosopher, etc., who wrote a number of very influential books. He is commonly acknowledged as an important contributor to the emergence of postmodernism in the 1970s. He contended, among other things, that logic and reason are not timeless entities, but are subject to historical contingency. And that's the main topic of The Order of Things. For The Order of Things is in fact a history book. Not a book about political history, but more the history of knowledge or even more precisely, the history of the changing preconditions of knowledge. You think that sounds complicated? Just wait for the rest. Foucault starts by asking the question I started this video with. How is it that men of the Renaissance, who were usually considered to have stepped out from the superstitious beliefs of the medieval period, could trust reports of magical properties of plants, or mythical origins of peoples? Why didn't they see the incompatibility between scientific evidence and magical beliefs, which seems so evident to us? Foucault's answer is episteme. In Foucault's usage, episteme means a precondition of knowledge. That is, what it's possible to think within a given culture and historical period. It's what makes sense, what's considered a valid argument. Although we often take for granted that people of previous times would agree with us if they had the same information that we do, Foucault claims that this is not the case. Based on extensive studies of scientific literature of the past 500 years, Foucault argues that Western culture has passed through different epistemes and that what has been possible to think in the different periods therefore has changed. What we usually consider historical periods, such as the Baroque, the Enlightenment, Romanticism, Positivism, are according to Foucault merely ripples on the surface. The really significant transitions have been on a level beneath and more fundamental than the usual historical periodization. In Foucault's terminology, this is the archaeological level, the level of the epistemes. After the medieval period, these have only been three in number. The Renaissance, up until about 1650, the Classical period, from about 1650 to 1800, and finally the Modern period, from about 1800, until and including Foucault's own day. Each episteme is defined by a key word, which in short describes the logic of the age or period. Now the key word for the episteme of the Renaissance is resemblance. For the Classical period, representation and for the modern period, historicity. The book in its entirety is a description of the evolution and contents of these three epistemes within the sciences we today know as economics, biology and philology. Foucault's point is this. If something resembled something else in the Renaissance, these were considered to have a logical connection. In the classical period, however, logic was based on the way things were represented or classified. And in modern times, there is logic in seeing how scientific concepts have evolved. Let's take the understanding of nature as an example. During the Renaissance, nature was studied and understood by the way in which plants, living creatures and the whole universe resembled each other. Animals were said to be like plants living head down. Plants were like terrestrial stars, and the stars were said to circle the sky just like a man's pulse would beat in his veins. The world was encoded in a way, it was God's encrypted message, and natural science was therefore, at its deepest level, the interpretation of this message. That's why magic and myth could make sense to Renaissance man, just as well as scientific investigations for they both revealed something about God's purpose. In the classical period, however, this had changed. What was now decisive for the study of nature 
was the classification of the different parts of plants. The world wasn't any longer considered to contain a hidden message to be deciphered. The question now was how nature could be represented in a table. This resulted in the impressive systems of classifications of the time. Remember, King Philip came over four ginger snaps? That's it. But at the transition into the modern period, nature went from being a static entity, whose characteristics could be classified, to having a history of its own. Now it was possible to understand that the many characteristics of the different species were a result of a long process of development, of evolution. It was the time of Darwin. So in this way, knowledge didn't only grow during these 500 years, but fundamentally changed character from episteme to episteme. And Foucault is clear that the theory of evolution of the modern period couldn't possibly have arisen during the Renaissance, just as little as we today can accept that magic should be on par with natural science in telling us something about nature. These thoughts are simply beyond the limits of the episteme of the age. Let me end by saying that I find the book incredibly interesting, but I find Foucault's way of writing extremely demanding, and I believe I'm not alone. His prose is almost lyrical, full of metaphors and abstractions, and often completely lacking in concrete examples, making you wonder whether you really know what he's on about. So if you're intent on reading Foucault yourself, be prepared to invest some serious energy into it. It's tough, but it's worth it. Good luck. That's all about Foucault, the order of things. If you want to learn more about theories of history, why don't you check out some of my other videos? Thanks for watching. See you.